What do you mean? I heard a cry. That was me. The Republican Party is trying to get us all killed again, and they're abusing the Constitution to do it. Oh, I never heard you yell before. One has moments. <sighs> you don't have a lot of passion, do you? What do you mean? I mean, there aren't a lot of things that upset you, that get you angry. Injustice does. The Constitution does. The same Constitution that the Republicans are abusing? Abusing? Using? It's a problematic document. Uh, that's what you think. What do you feel? It's radically dysfunctional in- What do you feel? <sighs> the U.S. Constitution is garbage. And here's why. In the summer of 1787, 55 wealthy white men braved travel hazards and heat stroke to gather in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to save the failing government of the United States of America. It was 11 years after the Declaration of Independence and 6 years after the British surrender at Yorktown. A few months before Yorktown, a permanent federal government came into existence with its powers defined by a written constitution, the Articles of Confederation. However, this federal government was very weak. It was funded by states that quite often chose not to contribute. It lacked the military strength to resist British and Spanish hostility on the Confederation's borders. It could not regulate international trade, nor trade between the states, some of which, by 1787, were on the verge of trade war. The inability of the federal government to pay its debts was turning into an existential threat. A few months earlier, the federal government's inability to pay veterans of the revolution who were being taxed off their farms in Massachusetts provoked an armed revolt. This revolt, known as Shays Rebellion, had to be put down by local militia since the federal army was too underfunded to respond. Anyway, let's get back to 55 white men in Philadelphia, where, I have it on good authority, it is always sunny. Their mission? Come up with a slate of amendments to strengthen the Articles of Confederation. After only a few weeks discussion, however, it became clear that what was needed was a whole new constitution. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have blown up like that. Well, I don't mind. It's like a whole other side of you I don't get ever get to see. <laughs> What's so funny about that? Oh, if you could see the monologues that go on in my head when we have these little conversations. Don't talk about us. Anyway, there's an unfortunate tendency in American political discourse to speak of the framers of the Constitution as though they were a single unit. Fifty-five men with a united goal. The way Republicans speak of them, you'd think they were some kind of hive mind collective. Who? The framers or the Republicans? Ah. Republicans often speak of the framers as though the framers were a hive mind. Ah, got it. I was confused because Republicans definitely act like a hive mind. That's only because they get all their propaganda from the same places. I get my propaganda from multiple sources, which might explain why I feel uncertain all the time. You seem pretty certain to me, confident in the things you say. It's all a front. Everything I believe is conditional and could fall apart in the face of better information. But I'm willing to learn more and risk finding out I'm wrong about something. It's better than the false comfort of unchallenged certainty. Hmm. All right. Okay, I've got my framers. How do you write a constitution? As with any diplomatic effort, you have to balance out competing interests. For example, small states worried about being outvoted and ignored. Under the Articles of Confederation, each state had one vote in Congress. If you replace that with population-based representation, small states lose power. Yes, but the right thing to do is to represent actual people rather than empty land. Not something you want to change if you benefit from the wrongness of the existing system. Speaking of wrongness, how many of these guys own slaves? About half of them. Even though they just fought a war against tyranny. They made an exception for slavery. Philosophers of classical liberalism made many exceptions. The Enlightenment was a major challenge to conservative monarchies, aristocracies, and religious authority. Liberalism, with its focus on human rights, the consent of the governed, and individual liberty, finds its roots in Enlightenment philosophy, as does the scientific method. However, liberalism's birth was flawed. While the philosophers of the time were happy to attack the concept of a divine right hierarchy of European society, they had no problems coming up with philosophical justifications of a hierarchy of human beings, with Europeans at the top and the victims of European colonialism at the bottom. Enlightenment-era scientists asked the question, why are Europeans superior to other races? They should have asked, are Europeans superior to other races? The answer is no, and in fact there's really no such thing as race. Heather Cox Richardson, in her book How the South Won the Civil War, points out that early America could develop as an egalitarian society only because women were excluded and Africans and natives were racialized. 
That said, the Constitution does a very good job of balancing out the competing interests of 18th century elites. It added a chief executive and a judiciary, something the Articles of Confederation lacked. It laid out the legal relationships between the states and subordinated them to the federal government. It clarified the ability of Congress and the states to change the government through the amendment process. The preamble lays out quite clearly the purpose of the entire document. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. After that, it all goes downhill. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, Actually, I, I learned the preamble from Schoolhouse Rock. Oh no. What is it? I forgot this was a game for at least three players. Thanks for wasting my time. Well, I guess the point of the game is that to get anything done, early American leaders had to work hard to find points of agreement. Like when they agreed that women and blacks and Indians weren't fully human. For one. The idea of a self-governing people was novel in the 18th century. There were only a handful of republics in the world, and most were run as oligarchies. As a representative democracy with thousands of voters, the U.S. was something of a nationwide social experiment. Mind you, only a small percentage of the adult population was allowed to vote. Doesn't sound very democratic to me. By modern standards, no. Today, I don't think there's any theory of constitutional democracy that would give us anything remotely like the 1787 Constitution. In the modern world, relying on long-dead rich white guys is no basis for a system of government. Nor is strange women lying in ponds distributing swords. What? Well, you can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you? Or because an aristocracy of slaveholders wrote a document that met the needs of the moment. Remember, the political order they set up failed spectacularly after less than 80 years, and hundreds of thousands of people died because of it. So what are the biggest problems with the Constitution? I'm glad you asked. Problem number one, the Senate, the whole institution. It was originally created as a sop to small states who feared a loss of influence under the new government. But partisan loyalties rather than state population became the dominant factor. The desire for one political party or another to dominate the Senate shaped the history of the nation, right down to its literal shape. The admission of new states became a political balancing act. Because they were outnumbered in the population-based House of Representatives, Slaveholding states would allow new states to be admitted to the Union only if it would not threaten the equal balance of slave and free states in the Senate. There were nine of each in 1812 and 15 of each in 1850. After the Civil War, Senate partisanship once again played a role in the admission of new states. In the 1870s and 1880s, the political elites of former Confederate states realized they could disenfranchise their black citizens without triggering a federal response. They turned their states into single-party fiefdoms run top to bottom by Democrats. The 51st Congress, which met from 1889 to 1891, had a slim Republican majority in the Senate, 39 to 37. Only 20 years before, Republicans held a 5 to 1 advantage. The old Confederacy formed a block of 22 guaranteed Democratic seats. Faced with the possibility of losing the majority, Republicans packed the Senate with low population states carved out of the empty quarter of the country, the Great Plains. Wyoming, Idaho, Washington, Montana, the Dakotas. Why are there two Dakotas? Because Republicans needed their Senate majority. To balance out this Senate packing from 130 years ago, to even have a chance at balance, Democrats would have to admit six territories as states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Marianas. And right now, two of those territories are represented by Republicans. So while the House represents the people of the United States, the Senate represents land, huge tracts of land, arbitrarily divided by historical accident and for political advantage. This arbitrary division means that the people of the United States have no real impact on the composition of the Senate. In 2018, the Democratic Party won 58% of the vote for the Senate and the Republican Party 39%, yet the Republicans gained two seats. Here's a possible future. Senate Democrats could win 51% of the vote for Senate in 2022 and 2024 and end up with only 43 seats. And it's not going to get better. By 2040, 70 Senate seats will be controlled by states accounting for less than a third of the national population. Well, that sucks. Yes, it has a very high suck factor. With only two senators per state, the Senate makes it possible for a small number of bad actors to kill legislation. Unlike Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Good example. Both of them are very conservative. The last conservative Democrats in the Senate, almost. 
both blocked passage of a voting rights bill, either because, like Republicans, they don't want black people voting, or because they would prefer to be part of a powerless minority. Why in the hell would they want to be part of a powerless minority? With no power comes no responsibility. Oh, like evil Peter Parker. Yes, they don't do any work, but they still have their prestige, and they still collect their paychecks. Why don't they just join a Republican party? They may be conservative and lazy, but they are not stupid, and being stupid is a requirement for winning Republican primaries. No, they're stupid. Blocking voting rights makes it easier for Republicans to beat Democrats. They don't care. They're white and they're rich, and they will be just fine. But, speaking of voting, we can't overlook the biggest problem with the Constitution. Problem number two, the Electoral College. A proposal to have Congress elect the president stalled due to concerns about the separation of powers. Letting the people vote directly for the president was also proposed, but got nowhere. While northern states had relatively wide suffrage, southern states did not, and would easily be outvoted. Some southern leaders were worried that, since the North was starting to emancipate their slaves, an outvoted South would be forced by the new stronger federal government to follow suit. Southern leaders weren't pro-suffrage, but they were pro-suffering, which remains true today. The compromise was the Electoral College. Something like it existed in the Holy Roman Empire, which for centuries had elected the emperor based on the votes of prince electors. Some of the framers regarded this as a defense against demagoguery, factionalism, and partisanship. Founding Father Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts opined that the people are uninformed and would be misled by a few designing men. Thus, the Electoral College would prevent grossly unqualified candidates from being elected to the presidency. <sighs> As it turns out, the Electoral College has never worked as the framers hoped. Political parties formed immediately the Constitution was signed. In every state, you had Federalists and Anti-Federalists debating ratification. You may have heard of the Federalist Papers. Sometimes one hears them talked about in reverent tones, as a Talmudic analysis of the framers' thoughts and wishes. In reality, the papers were three New York Federalists writing newspaper columns. And for you kids out there, a newspaper column is basically the printed script for a really lame YouTube video essay. Comment, like, and subscribe. Now, for anyone who has any respect for the idea of democratic legitimacy, the Electoral College is offensive. We have 200 years of official popular vote figures for presidential elections. Out of these 50 elections, more than a third were won by candidates who did not win a majority of the vote. Five times in those 200 years, the runner-up became president, including the 2000 and 2016 elections. The Electoral College is fundamentally indifferent to the whole concept of democratic legitimacy. Consider the Jim Crow era. When state and vigilante terror suppressed the black vote throughout the old confederacy, each of those states retained its full electoral vote, even though anywhere up to half of their citizens were not allowed to cast ballots. Furthermore, many states have a dominant political party. 80% of Americans live in a state whose electoral vote is essentially preordained. Presidential campaigns ignore them, focusing instead on the interests of the other 20% in so-called swing states. For example, California has been a reliably democratic state for over 30 years. Democratic presidential candidates take it for granted and rarely visit, except to attend fundraisers. Republican candidates frequently attack the state, condemning California liberals and San Francisco values. So a state in which nearly one in eight Americans live is usually ignored. That's not fair. Why do we still have the Electoral College? Same reason we still have the Senate. Conservatives and small states benefit from the unfairness of the system and want to keep it unfair. They argue that the Electoral College is part of the nation's federal composition, in which each state determines its own laws and the people therein determine how they want to live. Are which people get to vote? Yes. Are which people get civil rights? Uh, yes. Are whether women are considered fully human? Yes, I admit, it looks like under the federal system many states choose to use state power to trample human rights. But... Actually, I kind of painted myself into a corner. Whatever the benefits of the federal system, they're outweighed by this critical failure. Federalism hasn't stopped states from suppressing the rights of their citizens. It's been unable to prevent the weaponization of the Electoral College in which the GOP is currently engaged. You know, we did come close to abolishing the Electoral College about 50 years ago. How close? It passed the House with a 4 to 1 majority. Can you guess what happened? Filibustered in the Senate? It was filibustered in the Senate. The President, Richard Nixon, supported the proposal, but didn't really push for it. Oh. Was he too busy committing crimes? Probably. Which brings us to another problem with the Constitution. The United States is a presidential republic, which is a system in which the head of government is in charge of an executive branch of government entirely separate from the legislative branch. This is in contrast with a parliamentary government, in which the head of government is accountable to the legislature and dependent upon its support. 
Presidential systems are widespread in the Americas, parliamentary systems in Europe and the rest of the world. Presidential systems see a government in place for a fixed term. Changes in government are cyclical. The president serves with the support of the voters, not the legislature. In comparison, parliamentary systems seem unstable. Close elections can result in months of wrangling to assemble a governing coalition, or even another round of elections. Some coalitions bring together ideological adversaries and are extremely unstable. Even a stable government can collapse at any point between elections if it loses the confidence of the legislature. However, when a parliamentary government breaks, it's usually not a systemic crisis. When presidential democracies break, quite often the entire regime collapses, taking democracy with it. Juan Linz of Yale University points out that the only presidential democracy with long-term constitutional continuity is the United States. Ironically, the runner-up, Chile, had its democracy taken down by the United States in 1973. What makes parliamentary systems more stable is the fact that the legislature is the only democratically legitimate institution. The government's legitimacy derives from the legislature's support. The problem with presidential systems is that both the legislature and the executive are elected by the people, and both can claim equal democratic legitimacy. Presidential systems depend on cooperation to maintain their stability. When the legislature and the executive are controlled by ideologically different parties, there is no democratic principle that can resolve a political crisis that may arise. Chile in 1891 saw a dispute between the Congress and the President escalate to violence. After eight months of civil war, Congress won. To re-establish political stability, Congress weakened the presidency. This is known as the Parliamentary Era. The United States is now positioned for a similar democratic crisis. Once upon a time, there was enough ideological overlap between the two major parties that cooperation was the norm. Today, the Democratic Party is a congeries of competing interests somewhat united on the subject of civil rights and justice, but kind of a mess on everything else. The Republican Party is a united, authoritarian, ethno-nationalist movement dedicated to the preservation of an unjust racial and economic hierarchy. These visions of America are fundamentally incompatible. In parliamentary systems, power sharing and coalition building is fairly common. Governments in such systems often have people from different political parties in important positions. In presidential systems, however, elections are zero-sum. The winner takes all. In the U.S. presidential election of 2000, an evenly split electorate did not produce an evenly split distribution of power in the government. Instead, all appointees were career Republicans. Similarly, after the 2016 election, despite millions of voters preferring the Democratic candidate, the executive was staffed entirely by Republican appointees. The spectacular corruption of the Trump regime was enabled by another defect of presidential systems. It is extremely difficult to remove a corrupt president, and attempts to do so often rally that president's partisans. Removing a prime minister is almost easy. A vote of no confidence brings down their administration and new elections are held. Removing a president strains the entire system. The United States also does not benefit from the long delay between the election of a new president and their inauguration. For two and a half months, a defeated president still has full executive power. There is no limit to the mischief that could be caused by a departing president. You're talking about Trump and January 6th. Actually, I'm not. I'm thinking of much more mundane matters. Presidential pardons, for example. Bill Clinton issued a few controversial pardons during his last days in office. More seriously, Reagan administration officials involved in the sale of American weapons to Iran, the money for which was then used to fund a terrorist army in Nicaragua, received pardons from George H.W. Bush in his last month in office. Sounds like a cover-up. Yes, it does. It ended the investigation. You see the problem. There are no curbs on a lame duck president's power. It's bad enough they have fixed terms of office with the regular election cycles. And what's wrong with regular cycles? The timing of everything in our political system centers on the four-year cycle of presidential elections. Political propaganda ramps up in very predictable ways. Presidents start running for re-election on Inauguration Day. Rivals in the opposition start jockeying to be the replacement. I don't know what you expect them to do. It's the most powerful office in the country. I want people to pay attention to other offices. Keep in mind that no one in the legislature has any requirement to cooperate with the White House, even if they're in the same party, because the president and the legislature are both elected by the people. Are you talking about people who voted Democratic for president, but Republican for senator? <sighs> I'm getting worked up again. What I'm saying is that people pay attention to the presidential election and not to other elections, which often matter more. Do you remember how I greeted you the morning of January 6th after the Georgia elections for U.S. Senate? Oh, this better be good. I have four words for you. What? Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Oh my god! Oh yes! Oh my god! I think I just came. Yes, I do. 
that's one of the few times people paid attention to legislative elections. In midterm elections, with no president at the top of the ballot, voter turnout goes down by quite a bit, so much so that the party that holds the White House is expected to lose seats in Congress. Which is unfortunate because legislatures, federal and state, are where law gets made. I've heard state legislators called laboratories of democracy, is that true? Mm. Because people don't pay attention, they're more like the meth labs of democracy. It's shocking how often really incompetent people get elected to state legislatures. People like that end up as puppets of lobbyists, or start off that way. The laws with which most people have to live on a daily basis are written in state legislatures. Do you think that Democrats will lose control of Congress? According to polling, it's more likely than not. God damn it. It's been hard enough to get anything fixed, and now it's going to be worse. That's another problem with the Constitution. Too many veto points. I thought only the president had a veto. Under our system, it's hard to pass legislation and easy to kill it. To make law, these are the numbers you have to keep in mind. 218, 60, 1, 5. I'm not good with math puzzles. A bill needs 218 representatives to approve it in the House, because that's a majority of the 435 seats. A bill needs 60 of the Senate's 100 seats, because for some reason we decided 50 years ago to do it that way. It takes one president to sign it. And the five? The five is another problem with the Constitution. Actually, I exaggerate. The problem is not the existence of the Supreme Court. The problem is lifetime tenure for Supreme Court justices, which may or may not be a constitutional issue depending on whether you believe Congress can change that, but you know who has the final word on that. Anyway, the Supreme Court currently has nine seats. It takes a majority of five to allow a law to stand if challenged. As we have learned in the first quarter of the 21st century, the court can ignore the clear intent of Congress by simply interpreting legislation to mean its opposite. In theory, Congress could pass another law clarifying the meaning of the first law, but nothing would stop the court from maliciously reinterpreting that one as well. In any case, the Republicans on the court rely on the Senate filibuster to forestall any challenge to their behavior for the foreseeable future. Supreme Court justices hold their seats for life, which is why Republican presidents have been selecting young nominees. They want those people in place to rewrite law in a way that favors Republican priorities, such as eliminating worker rights, civil rights, and other impediments to formal plutocracy. What the court can't rewrite, they want it to overturn. Herein lies the only flaw in their thinking. A lawless Supreme Court can trigger the unraveling of the United States. How can the economy survive when the law becomes whatever is politically convenient at the moment? How can any individual or group organize their existence when the law as written is utterly meaningless? Then let's add more seats to the court. Do nine men interpret? Nine men, I nod. What's that? It's a palindrome. Oh. Never mind. I think you can understand why I think the Constitution has issues. I'm with you. Let's replace it. I have some bad news for you. The Declaration of Independence sets out in plain language that the people have the right to change their system of government. The Constitution expresses that right in Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. That is a lot of work. No wonder the Constitution has rarely been amended. There are a total of 27 amendments. 11 were proposed in 1789, 3 were proposed in the wake of the Civil War, and 1 was proposed, ratified, and repealed. So that's two sets of amendments and 11 individual ones in over 240 years. That's it. That's how hard it is to amend the Constitution. The bar is pretty high. Two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate means that 136 representatives, or 34 senators, can block a proposed amendment. Three-quarters of the states mean that 13 states can block an amendment passed by Congress. That means the 13 smallest reliably Republican states, representing one-twelfth of the American people, can kill reform. For example, an amendment abolishing the Electoral College, or reforming the Senate, or the Supreme Court, or an Equal Rights Amendment, or one establishing a right to vote, which the document still does not have. Well, what about a new Constitutional Convention? That, that was in Article 5. Yes, it is. But that risks nuking the whole thing. A Constitutional Convention has plenary power. Remember, the one that produced the current Constitution was convened to amend the Articles of Confederation. That's a bad thing? There's a lot of vested interest in the current arrangement. Nothing shakes the society. 
Nothing shakes an economy. Nothing shakes the business world more than uncertainty. And any rewriting of the Constitution would create a lot of uncertainty. I say we take off and nuke the entire document from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. This Constitution has a substantial dollar value attached to it. They can bill me. Look, this is an emotional time for all of us. I know that. But let's not make snap judgments. This is clearly an important document we're dealing with, and I don't think you or I or anybody else wants to go into a constitutional convention with QAnon people. Oh. A third of our population has fox brain. They are saturated with malicious disinformation spread by grifters and far-right propagandists. Convening a constitutional convention with that many functionally insane people would end badly. So we do nothing? We have to survive the current assault on democracy with the rules we have in place. After that, we can talk about reform. Maybe you haven't been keeping up on current events, but we're getting our asses kicked. Even with reforms, there are no guarantees. Any rules-based system relies on people engaging with it and with each other in good faith. Rules can be abused, their intent subverted, their system manipulated. The flaw, dear barbarian, is not in our stars, but in the Mitch McConnells of the world. You're not giving me any solace. Then let me tell you the good news. We have been here before. No political alignment is permanent. Political scholars often refer to the current political alignment as the Sixth Party System. This is the system in which the Republican Party represents authoritarian whites and the Democratic Party represents everyone else. The GOP is outnumbered. The America of today is so much better than the America of the past. In 1960, millions of Americans throughout the South were not allowed to vote. In 1970, women could not get financial credit. In 1980, two-thirds of white Americans opposed interracial marriage. In 1990, three-quarters of Americans opposed same-sex marriage. On balance, American civil rights are better than they've ever been, despite the restrictions of capitalism and militarized state authorities. It's no wonder capitalists and fans of state authority, Republicans, are fighting back so fiercely. And, as fans of authority, they are going to make rhetorical appeals to authority. That means continued talk of the will of the founders, the wisdom of the framers, and the sacredness of the Constitution. People who treat the Constitution as sacred are engaging in a kind of pagan ancestor worship. The framers had specific political beliefs rooted in their 18th century lives and societies. They created institutions to advance and protect those beliefs. But they don't live here anymore. Humanity has learned a lot about how to run a democratic republic. The framers were inspired by enlightenment thought, empirical thought. They themselves would reject the idea that their words outweigh our lives. The social processes that are making America better have been going on for a long time. They still have another decade or two to go. We won't know when the struggle is over, because by then, there will be a new struggle. A seventh party system. Until we get there, there will be battles won and battles lost. The Republicans are outnumbered, which is why they've given up on democracy. The Democratic Party that finally wins will be something America's never had before. A major political party composed of people impacted by sexism and bigotry, or ideologically committed to rooting them out. Some of that is already present. It should be nurtured and encouraged. As inadequate as it is now, the 1787 Constitution was a good document for its time. When we were in a position to replace the Constitution with something better, we really didn't need to. Perhaps the right thing to do is not to reject the Constitution, but to revitalize it with new possibility. As long as judges insist they can interpret the Constitution, it is up to Americans to support candidates for the presidency and the Senate who will appoint judges open to better interpretations. That just puts us back where we started. Yes, it does. You're looking for structural answers to what are really political problems. You're the one listing the structural problems. Pointing out that part of the federal government does something badly is not the same as calling for its abolition. Doing so ignores the main problem. Which is? Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham, <sighs> Kevin McCarthy, Jim Jordan, John Roberts, uh. Clarence Thomas. You cannot design a system immune to the attacks of saboteurs. So we just carry on? We keep fighting. We will lose battles. We'll lose on some big issues. We lost on abortion rights, but we're winning in the wider culture. Almost every American is okay with interracial marriage now. Almost three out of four support same-sex marriage. In general, when you compare Americans over 40 with Americans under 40, the under 40s are more open to criminal justice, economic justice, social justice. I don't buy it. There are plenty of conservatives under 40. That's true, but from the polling I've seen, there are only three conservative 25-year-olds for every four conservative 50-year-olds. A small shift, but it can build up over time. What will stop the GOP from seizing power and just crushing everybody under 40? That's a topic for another time. Okay. Okay. You got any more games you want to play? 
Oh, always. Let me show you one of my favorites. Does it work with two players? Well, crap. Hello, I'm Alexandra Farwell, and I'm inviting you to an experiment. So far, each show has consisted of one or two little solace vignettes, and often a finding solace, as separate videos before the main segment. Let's see what happens if we take an omnibus approach. The main segment, followed by the most recent little solaces, and finding solace. Well, that's a new look for you. I am going outside. But you're a shut-in. You said you don't like to be seen. Ah, but where I'm going, I won't be seen. Where's that? A secluded corner of the hotel grounds. Behind some overgrown undergrowth, next to the new cemetery fence, there's a broken fountain. Isn't it lovely? Ah, yeah. So what are you going to do? It's useless as a fountain now, so I thought I would put some soil on each level and plant some flowers. Why? I need a hobby. At some point I will heal enough that I don't need this mask anymore. Once I'm out in the world again, it would be nice to be able to talk to people about something other than the history books I've been reading and the big map games I've been playing. So, um, what are you going to plant? Well, I love purple, so I was thinking African violets. I need to read up on... What about the violets you got before the pandemic started? What? I think you forgot to water them. Oh no, when the plague came, I forgot all about them. I can't even tell what they are. I am the black thumb. I killed my violets. This just goes to show you that violets is not the answer. Shut up! Actually, that was pretty good. I'll think of a different hobby. Probably for the best. Plant murderer. Oh... What's going on? The absinthe ritual. A ritual? For absinthe? Yes. I thought you usually had it with champagne. Or in a cocktail, yes. But sometimes one seeks the green fairy on her own. You are so weird. Quiet, you. On a scale of 1 to 10, this drink is an 11. So, you gonna drink it? Oh, goodness, no. It needs to be diluted further. Why don't you just shoot it? Because it would burn my throat and sear my taste buds. Remember, it's an 11. That's it? No. Now we watch the sugary water drip into the absinthe. Oh, God, just pour the water! No, it's part of the ritual. We see the sugar and water mix into the absinthe and watch it swirl while we contemplate our existence. Eleven out of ten, remember? What if you just want something to drink? There are other drinks. That's my point. But this one goes to eleven. Waste of time. She doesn't understand you like I do. Eleven. With a feeling of deep yet most singular affection, I regarded my friend Morella. My soul from our first meeting burned with fires it had never before known, but the fires were not of Eros. I could in no manner define their unusual meaning or regulate their vague intensity. Fate bound us together at the altar, and I never spoke of passion nor thought of love. She, however, shunned society and, attaching herself to me alone, rendered me happy. Morella's erudition was profound. I felt this, and in many matters became her pupil. She placed before me a number of mystical writings. I entered with an unflinching heart into the intricacies of her studies. And then, when poring over forbidden pages, would Morella place her cold hand upon my own and rake up from the ashes of a dead philosophy some low, singular words. And then would I dwell upon the music of her voice until, at length, its melody was tainted with terror. And thus joy suddenly faded into horror, and the most beautiful became the most hideous. Those disquisitions formed almost the sole conversation of Morella and myself. 
The notion of that identity which at death is or is not lost forever was to me a consideration of intense interest, not more from the perplexing and exciting nature of its consequences than from the marked and agitated manner in which Morella mentioned them. But the time had now arrived when the mystery of my wife's manner oppressed me as a spell. I could no longer bear the touch of her wan fingers, nor the low tone of her musical language, nor the luster of her melancholy eyes. And she knew all this, but did not upbraid. She seemed conscious of my weakness or my folly, and, smiling, called it fate. In time, the crimson spot settled steadily upon the cheek, and the blue veins upon the pale forehead became prominent. And one instant, my nature melted into pity, but in the next, I met the glance of her eyes, and then my soul sickened. Shall I then say that I longed with an earnest and consuming desire for the moment of Morella's decease? I did. But the fragile spirit clung to its tenement of clay for many days. But one autumnal evening, when the winds lay still in heaven, Morella called me to her bedside. It is a day of days, she said. I am dying, yet shall I live. The days have never been when thou couldst love me. But her whom in life thou didst abhor, in death thou shalt adore. Within me is a pledge of that affection which thou didst feel for me, Morella. And when my spirit departs, shall the child live, thy child and mine, Morella's. She turned away her face upon the pillow, and I heard her voice no more. Yet, as she had foretold, her child, to which in dying she had given birth, which breathed not until the mother breathed no more, her child, a daughter, lived. And she grew strangely in stature and intellect, and was the perfect resemblance of her who had departed. Strange indeed was her rapid increase in bodily size, but terrible were the tumultuous thoughts which crowded upon me while watching the development of her mental being. Could it be otherwise when I daily discovered in the conceptions of the child the adult powers and faculties of the woman? And, as years rolled away, Day after day did I discover new points of resemblance in the child to her mother, for that her eyes were like Morella's I could endure, but then they too often looked down into the depths of my soul with Morella's own intense and bewildering meaning. And in the ringlets of the silken hair, and in the sad musical tones of her speech, and above all in the phrases and expressions of the dead on the lips of the loved and living, I found food for consuming thought and horror. Thus passed away two lustra of her life, and as yet my daughter remained nameless upon the earth. Morella's name died with her at her death. Of the mother I had never spoken to the daughter, but at length the ceremony of baptism presented to my mind, and at the baptismal font I hesitated for a name. What prompted me then to disturb the memory of the buried dead? What demon urged me to breathe that sound? What fiend spoke from the recesses of my soul when I whispered within the ears of the holy man the syllables, Morella? What more than fiend convulsed the features of my child as she turned her glassy eyes from the earth to heaven and, falling prostrate upon the black slabs of our ancestral vault, responded, I am here. Distinct, Coldly fell those few simple sounds within my ear, and thence, like molten lead, rolled hissingly into my brain. And I kept no reckoning of time or place, and the stars of my fate faded from heaven, and therefore the earth grew dark, and its figures passed by me like flitting shadows, and among them all I beheld only Morella. The winds of the firmament breathed but one sound within my ears, and the ripples upon the sea murmured evermore, Morella. But she died, and with my own hands I bore her to the tomb, and I laughed with a long and bitter laugh as I found no traces of the first in the charnel where I laid the second, Morella. Hello again.
I'm afraid that by letting you know about this experiment, I've already spoiled it. We'll try it again next time. And if anyone asks, just tell them you're part of the control group. I'll see you next time. Unless the conditions of the experiment don't allow it. Thank you.